How's the post-lunch food coma? <laughs> Doing good? Excellent. So before we get started, and because I'm turning on my little remote here to connect, I'm going to have everyone do something I like to do, which is a nice stretch to release a lot of tension, because we're about to talk about security. And I feel like it's necessary. <laughs> so if you guys could actually just stand up, we're just going to stretch it out. Not kidding. Yep. <laughs> If you have the body room for it, sideways is always a benefit. But you almost never realize how much stress you hold in your shoulders, especially when you're hunched over a security incident going, oh no, why is this happening to me? It's 5 p.m. on a Friday and someone pushed production. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so before I get started, y'all can sit down if you go with your stretching. Warning, there are some text heavy slides. But don't panic because I have all the slides up online and I'll be providing a link to that, including all of the links that I used as resources and all the links for additional reading. So it's gonna be a hefty page, but everything will be there. So let's get started. One thing I wanted to start with is just a quick top level overview of a few terms and just some security objectives because it's really easy to conflate things and I wanna make sure that we're all understanding at least what I hope we're understanding as I go through the log management cycle and security. So first up, hash, we've probably heard that term before, right? It's when you obscure data in a way that you don't need to recover it. Sometimes you'll salt your hash, which means that you're either prepending or pending a string to that string value, so that when you're hashing it, it's not exploitable using what's called a rainbow table, which is when someone takes common dictionary attacks and hashes them for you, because helpful. Well, the third one that I wanted to make sure that we're all aware of is encryption, which is when you're obscuring data in a reversible way so that you actually can recover what the original information is. And this is highly relevant for logs in particular, right? You hash a password, but you encrypt a log, right? Also, this is very helpful for you for anything you do after you leave here today or in the future of your career. It's important not to bloat the word security because it means a lot of different things. It has a lot of objectives and it has a lot of context. And this is not an exhaustive list, but just to get started, to help you think about some more granularity to your queries. If you Google something like, how do I secure my logs? Your responses will be all over the map because you're using security and it can mean all of these things and they will pepper into your results and they may not be helpful to you. But if what you care about is, oh, I wanna make sure that the log that's received by the aggregation server matches log that's been sent by the shipper, then you're caring about integrity. If you wanna make sure that only the people who, can, who you want to see logs can see logs, you care about authorization. Etc. So if you're always aware of your objectives, you will get better search results in general, and that will help you beyond the scope of this talk. Also, and this is the biggest trap that I think everyone falls into, what do I not mean by security? Security by obscurity, please don't do that ever. Don't do it. And the reason we don't do it is because there are consequences. For example, quick consequence number one, but they don't know where it is, so that's fine. It's fine, but it's not fine because the second that you've separated how much power it takes to build the exploit versus deploy the exploit, it becomes a trivial issue, right? Because once they've figured out where the thing is that you conveniently thought they were unaware of, it no longer matters because computers are fast and they'll just deploy it all over the place and you're stuck. Also, not your roommate, don't share your keys. You want to make sure that you're logically separating your keys and being aware of key management. You don't want to share them. Part of this is because of your audit trail. If you're not making sure that the keys are associated with certain users or services, then when you try and check out what's happening later, everybody's an EC2 user. Yay. Right? I could keep going. I could probably build a whole presentation on this alone, but I'm not going to. So you get me. And now we're going to try and figure out how this applies to log management. First step, what does the log lifecycle look like? It looks a little something like this, right? You have a service or an app and it's creating a log. That log is written to disk. That log file or log entry is shipped somewhere. It is consumed and converted, which can happen kind of in either order. And the conversion just means making it hierarchical like JSON or something that's usable by you. Um, and then of course, after a certain point, depending on your regulations or needs, at some point you'll need to destroy the data and you'll need to do that safely as well. I'm gonna be focusing pretty heavily on this create junction. Why? Because if you don't create it, they can't take it from you. So don't, <laughs> right? What do I mean by sensitive data though? 
another non-exhaustive list, but yet text heavy slide. There are lots of things that we might be tempted to use as sensitive data in our logs. Social Security num numbers is half a joke, but considering how many breaches we've had lately, not really a joke. You know, and then you have things like financial information or patient data, and some of those are more obvious and pretty broad, right? If you're working in finance, you probably know not to do that. If you're working in healthcare, you probably know not to do that. But some of the things that might be less obvious is, for example, a pass-fail or a percent pass-fail, where if someone figures out that they only need a 75% pass on that fingerprint scan, that they can iteratively get to 75% and pass, and they will know how close or far they are every time they try. So you wanna make sure you're not doing anything that can help someone intrude onto your system. Same with database queries. You might need to know that the query failed. You probably don't need to know its full syntax, right? Or if you do, you need to protect it in such a way that if someone gets access to what you've just logged, that they can't now also use that as a malicious query later. Again, this list goes on. It's not exhaustive, but it does help you start to think about the types of things that you would want to protect on the creation side. But what is the best rule of thumb is only log what you need. And this goes to knowing your data very well. If you know your data and you say, okay, I know my infrastructure, I know my data, and I know that I need this much information to troubleshoot a problem with the service and nothing else, trim the rest out. And then you can analyze what's on the inside and say, I know that this is sensitive, so I will hash encrypt or whatever it and ship it out accordingly. But sometimes you still ask yourself, Self, I really want to write sensitive data. I, I really would like to expose IP addresses in my logs so that someone can reverse engineer my infrastructure. Okay, maybe you don't say it quite like that. But you might say it similarly, and just so you know, this is common weakness number 532, which means people say this dialogue to themselves often enough that it's in a database for security professionals to search. So it comes up. So my advice around this is instead of shipping it directly, you ship around it, right? So this goes back to what I was talking about before about hashing and encrypting, but you can also redact or tokenize, and you can make references to something instead of directly writing it into your log, because odds are you don't need it in your log, you need to know to look it up from somewhere else. If for some bizarre reason you do need social security numbers, because I'm picking on them today, you don't need that in your log, you need a reference point to say, look it up in the text of the log. Right? And that will protect the social security number and help whoever has to troubleshoot whatever's going on. Whatever you're doing, make sure you're keeping track of whatever regulation requirements you may or may not have. PCI, SOC 2, HIPAA, I'm sure there are some for aviation and et cetera as well. If you're in a regulated industry, there are probably some guidelines that you should and could be following to make sure that you're only writing in and shipping out data that is safe and successfully redacted. Once you've gotten this far, we need to worry about the next step, which is, of course, writing the actual file. So when the log is written to file, odds are you don't need to go into the volume or wherever physical disk that is storing the log file, right? So you can lock this right down, right? So whoever is accessing it is probably limited to the microservice or the application that's writing to the log. Log should be append only because you don't really want to retroactively say, oh, this event wasn't real. It was real. <laughs> We need to accept it as part of our logs. So if you care about an intrusion into the disk, for whatever reason, you can also encrypt the log file itself. And when you do that, you can also use something called forward secure sealing, which covering that in depth is well beyond scope of the 20 minutes or so that I have. But forward secure sealing is basically using different keys for different points in time. So if I, as an intruder, get access to your current logging encryption key, I can't cover my tracks with the past data because I don't have those keys. And that can help you against certain forms of attack. Also, of course, rotate your logs because if the log isn't there and all I have access to is the volume housing the files, then I don't have access to whatever is not physically in front of me. Once you've done all that, we gotta ship it so we can actually ship it this time. If you're using a third-party solution, make sure that you're using secure shipping. That might go without saying, but if you're using an on-prem solution, not only should you still be shipping it securely, but you can also guard your network, right? You might not be able to protect against the internet, but you can certainly protect your own network. And if you make sure that you're not, for example, leaving the network and coming back in to ship your logs from wherever A to the logging aggregation server is, that can help protect your traffic a lot. 
and a lot of exploits can be prevented from Lake Manamo and all the commonly known network exploits that pop up in this case. And again, regardless, you want to make sure you're limiting key access to the centralized logging server so that it is the only thing ca that can decrypt the logs. Because at this stage, right, we've taken the log, it was in memory, we wrote it to disk, and we're shipping it out. But as a user, I'm still not a at the consumable phase because this is not how I access the log. Unless something's going wrong and I'm troubleshooting IT, I'm not touching any of these things. So I don't need to decrypt them either. What I do need to do is get into this phase, which is where I do care about it. So once the logging aggregation server has log, if you've encrypted it, it can decrypt it and put it into a usable format. The common concern here is access controls. Whether or not you're using your own hosted solution or a third party solution, you need access controls. And you need a way to logically separate your data too. This might go without saying, but interns, they're great. They do a lot of labor for us, but maybe you don't want them to access production on accident just in case because learning is hard. And if you don't have an ability, if you have all of your logs going to a logging aggregation server and you do not have the ability to separate out into sub accounts, separate accounts, or whatever makes sense for your solution, they can accidentally trip up on things that they don't mean to, right? So it's your responsibility to protect that information. But also as your engineering team grows, needs change. Your initial solution might be for a seven team engineering startup that expands to a 100 team, very heavily siloed in skill engineering like squad almost, right? Where you have separate people for the web development, separate people for different apps, separate people for different services and so forth. And you wanna make sure that everyone has access to everything they need, but not much more than that, right? You also, going back to something I mentioned earlier, wanna make sure that you're denying or limiting use of malformed or intentionally malicious queries. Elastic actually wrote a really nice blog post in 2014 that can help you start thinking about this, even if you're not using Elk. Because it's not common for people to write a blog post about, hey, this is how you topple our stack. But they did it a long time ago when it was no longer the current version of their stack and they fixed it, so it's all good. But it can help you think about things like, okay, well, even if I'm not using Elastic, maybe I'm using an APM. <laughs> maybe I'm using somebody else. Maybe I'm using a different service or a type or I'm using my own on-prem, whatever and I need to actually think about what breaks the solution and how do I make sure that people can't accidentally break it because most commonly, and I say that with a little asterisk, but most commonly you're gonna run into people unintentionally, like a malformed query that, oh no, has a wildcard where it doesn't belong and they've suddenly confused and crashed your logging server. It's not usually a malicious attack. Again, asterisks in general. Moving on to destruction. You need to secure your own destruction, right? Also comes up often, quite a bit more often than the other one, actually, number 117. Secure destruction is hard, right? And it depends, again, a lot on what you've chosen to implement in your logging solution. Some differences between on-prem versus SaaS versus regulated versus not regulated. A common example might be something like HIPAA. If you have an on-prem HIPAA, depending on the data you're writing, you might be required to physically shred your drives. That might be a thing. If you're doing an on-prem solution for something like an e-commerce app, it's less about the shredding and more about making sure that people can't scrape around for different queries, right? Or things that have been, transactions, not queries, I'm sorry. Um, and so that people can't pull things out of your, your resulting information that maybe has been sitting and ignored because it's a month or two or five years old. If you're keeping up with regulation requirements, some of this is documented for you. You need to make sure that you know the difference between a delete and a wipe. One is saying this space is available. One is actually writing over that space so that it can't be recovered by certain tools that are designed to do exactly that. If you're doing some certain types of delete, you might be interested in a cryptographic erase, which is when you delete the key that decrypts the data, whether or not you actually delete the data. And the idea there is it becomes then kind of impossible to recover the data even if the data is physically found. So all these things might be helpful to you as you go forth and delete your information. And now for some closing thoughts. Closing thought number one, know your data, right? I've said it a few times, but there are certain things that apply to how you've designed your application, your infrastructure, and everything else. If you don't know your data beyond what's blatantly obvious, you won't be able to know if you're accidentally writing something that can give someone more insight into your solution than maybe you intended them to have. Relatedly, Know your infrastructure. And again, I made that clip earlier about writing IP addresses so someone can reverse engineer 
secure infrastructure. It's not all about API or um, IP addresses. There's also API endpoints. There are lots of things that people can do to reverse engineer your solution that you probably don't want appearing in your logs. Once you've figured out what all of that is, you need to assess the risk, right? So when you're assessing the risk, you need to be mindful of, okay, if someone has this information, what damage can they do with it? Because it's not physically feasible to have an engineering team, pretty much of almost any size, to actually successfully secure every security objective on every application, service, and everything down its whole stack. It's just not, we don't have enough human time. But what we can do is prioritize and say, this is the highest risk, and we're gonna secure it first, and we're gonna go down the list. And we can't go down the list in a mindful way if we don't assess it. Again, may go without saying, don't apply anything that's not relevant to you. You know, you see a lot of information about HIPAA and SOC 2 and PCI, but if you're not any of those things, it's limitedly helpful, right? It can help you learn some ideas that you weren't previously aware of, but it doesn't immediately apply to your web server, right? So when you're, when you're searching things out, make sure that you're keeping it within scope for whatever concerns or objectives that you have currently. Trust and verify your tools and frameworks because we all have things that make our lives easier, but, and we trust them not to hemorrhage our data, but make sure they're not. You know, that would be a horrible thing to find out, and sometimes people do, right? You'll be using a framework for a period of time and not realize that it's doing something or taking a shortcut that you would prefer that it not take because you know your data better than this third party or open source framework does. Make good use of your metrics because if someone does intrude on your system, in all likelihood, you'll notice a metric spike somewhere. For example, if someone is able to pop a crypto miner on some EC2 <coughs> instance somewhere in there, you'll notice a spike in CPU and memory. And even if you don't know the direct cause yet, you know that it's not relevant to whatever should be happening at that time and you can go in there and check it out and hopefully find what's happened. To that end, make sure that you're using your audit trail because you can't tell who popped that crypto miner or anything else like that on there if everyone's EC2 user. And that's only half a joke, right? Because how many people have encountered a situation where maybe there weren't as many specific accounts as there ought be, right? A couple of nervous hands because you don't know if I'm actually pulling you or not. But realistically, if everyone's the same user, you can't tell if it was an external user who did something or an internal user that accidentally did something either. And you need to be able to tell that information to be able to recover or know where it's coming from or block it as the case may be. I will say this using alerts judiciously, but I will say it with an asterisk because it's very hard to pattern match on un unknowns, right? There are a lot of seen products out there that help with this known security exploits, but in general, flipping back to know your data, if you know that social security numbers are a risk, those are an easy pattern match. You can just make it alert and say, if anything matches this pattern in a log file or a log file with this source, alert me. Or IP addresses are another known easily greppable thing. But a lot of logs aren't so easily formatted and there are messages. So use this with caution and use it where applicable and use it for the most sensitive things because you don't really wanna be woken up at unreasonable times for things that could be solved during the business day. Also, Make sure you get help when you need it. You're not expected to be DevSecOps. We're not gonna just keep shoving things into the DevOps specialties until we can't actually make it a word anymore. <laughs> That's not an ideal scenario. And no one should expect you to be an expert in every aspect of IT simultaneously. That's why we leverage each other for support. All that said, you, know, you can bring in external help for things, even if it's just for questions, but also you can have someone run pen testing or social engineering testing on your app. And what they might find is something like, oh, well, shipping labels were not considered a high priority, so I'm going to not intentionally not pay attention to them, and all of a sudden, the security consultancy has grepped out my client list from my shipping labels. Whoops. But I wouldn't have known to maybe look for that, but they did, and that's why you make sure to leverage the help that you need. Tip number 10 is, again, prevention is important, and it is the difference between this is a problem and this is a disaster. There is a difference between, I wish you didn't have this log file, and I really needed you to not have this log file. And I see some of you laughing. You know, I feel like you know in your soul this is true. So it's very important to protect everything going into the file before it's shipped anywhere, before it's even written to a file, right, at that generation stage. And that can save you a lot of heartache later. And this is the slide to take a photo of, if that is your interest to do. I have lots of extra reading on there too, so be prepared for that, as well as a book or two. 
I'm going to wait for a second. Cool. All right. And that is the beginnings of securing over the log management cycle. My name is Quintessence. I am a new tech evangelist for AppDynamics. And if you have any questions, please find us at the booth or just find me walking around in this lovely blue shirt. Thank you. We have time to take questions. Okay. Okay. Apparently, I have time to take questions if anyone wants to do that. <laughs> yes. That's you. <laughs> the biggest tip I would have is to encourage a culture that has explicit onboarding. This goes beyond logging, to be clear, it's intentionally brought because when you're onboarding new employees, you teach them what to care about. But once you start doing explicit onboarding, you can do explicit onboarding for team changes as well. And as part of that process, you would say the people who have the knowledge can pass on that knowledge and the people who don't can start to iteratively add to whatever that transfer process is and say, I didn't know to ask this and we figured it out, and now every time it's more complete. But I, I think, because communication is gonna be the biggest comp, like, inhibitor there. Yeah. Yes, to repeat that, I talked about tokenizing. What does the token point to? It depends on where you've stored it, right? So you might be tokenizing something that's a reference to data. You might be, so you tokenize that, and then you find where that's pointing. It might be as simple as pointing to a database realistically, and in my experience, that's gonna be the most common, right? Because you've stored the data you're pointing to usually in a database or something of that nature. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. So I'm on an engineering team, and one of our goals recently has been to shift left on security and okay. put our app in front of our internal security team for an audit as soon as possible. Do you have any suggestions on how we could improve that process? Is it, in, is it an internal team or an external team for the it's auditing? It's internal. It is internal? It's more of a penetration test okay. or um, just a data. Do you audit. know if you're having them test black box or not? Uh, no. Okay, so what I mean no. by that is there are two ways that you can penetra penetration test that I know of off the top of my head. And one is you're doing it with knowledge of the code base and one is you do it without. If you provide them, it's two different types of tests and there are benefits to both and I'm not gonna advocate for one over the other, especially without knowing you know, what you're working on. But in general, if you can do either or both, that will be helpful. But you wanna make sure you're communicating that to the team, right? If they think that they're supposed to be getting access to something that they don't have or vice versa, that can be a problem. Usually with penetration, it's pretty well documented. And I actually, at a prior company I was working at when we did similar, but with an external consultancy, what I did is I downloaded a, a, a checklist basically for penetration testing and I made sure that we were on the same page for all of those items and anything else they thought to bring to the table. It's important to leverage their expertise in this area too because this, the reason you're bringing them in or hired them is because they know to ask certain questions that you don't yet. So once you compile your list of things that you know to care about, make sure you say, hey, is there anything you would like to contribute? And make sure that they're being treated as equal contributors. Right, it's not a top-down scenario where someone is viewed as higher above them. That can stalwart that process, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. I think you, or no, oh no, there's, okay. Does anybody else? Okay, so you're asking about how to secure data that's going into logging for the SMP, SMTP server specifically? SFTP. Oh, SFTP. Okay, so in that case, I mean, it's generally still gonna be a matter of encrypting or hashing the relevant or just redacting, depending on how much control do you know, how much control do you have over it? Because I couldn't catch the, some of the precursor. The SFTP server, it won't so it's, it's all in house? Yeah. So you can redact the irrelevant bits out of anything that's getting logged, right? When you're, when you're having it write whatever events that it's transacting. So make sure that you're doing a lot of heavy redaction is what I would say off the top of my head, or not knowing your specific implementation. If there's anything that you need to recover, just encrypt, rather than you know, overloading your log, just encrypt the whole thing and ship it encrypted. All right, well it was great to speak with you and I'll be out in the cycle bit of the cyclorama. <laughs>